Thanks for joining us on Shannon's Club TV, where we look back on significant cars in Australia. In each episode, we offer a unique perspective on our feature car's presence on the road and in competition. We'll also take an up-close look at an owner's example, and we get the latest market news from the Shannon's auctions team. In today's episode, we review the small Japanese car that put the world on notice, the Toyota Corolla. The 1967 Toyota Corolla KE10 is one of the four most important Japanese sedans sold in Australia in the 1960s, and certainly the most important Japanese car of its time. The other three standouts are the Corona, Datsun 1600 and the Mazda 1500. The Corolla was the first small car that seriously advanced that category since the UK debut of the Isagonis Mini Miner in 1959. The fact that it took a Japanese manufacturer to improve markedly on what the English, Germans and Italians in particular had been doing for decades is in itself a remarkable thing. The success of first the Corona and then the Corolla is not just about the excellence of Toyotas, it also reflects the rapid development of the Japanese automotive industry and what I'd like to call a changing of the guard in Australian tastes. Mm. Mark, by the time the KE10 Corolla arrived locally, mm. it wasn't such a surprise, was it, to see Japanese cars on Australian racetracks? No, I mean, certainly at Bathurst, you know, in 1965, we saw the arrival of the, the original shovel-nosed AMI-entered Toyota Coronas and, of course, Colin Bond's little Isuzu Billette. Then in 1966, we had cars like Prince 1500s and even works-backed Datsun 1300. So by 1967, when the Corolla arrived, the Japanese presence in the small car classes there was becoming quite prominent. Of course, with the arrival of the Corolla and then other Datsuns and things, it just was set to boom in the years to come. Absolutely. Mm. The June 1967 edition of Wheels magazine had road tests of the esteemed Peugeot 404 and the new Corolla. The overall performance of both, surprisingly, was remarkably similar. The Peugeot had a slightly higher top speed, but the Toyota went faster in third gear, an astonishing 71 miles per hour. And how about four on the floor instead of a weird column shift? The wheels tester reckoned the new Corolla had good room for four adults, a comfortable driving position and neat instrumentation. He raved about the car's looks. The KE10 Corolla is one of the most important cars of the 20th century. It was the first to insert four wheels beneath many Japanese families. Not only that, it redefined the conventional small car of the second half of the 1960s, combining the kind of performance and sportiness that had previously been reserved for sport sedans, some of which, like the Peugeot 404 and Fiat 1500, still had column gear shifts. In some respects, we can see it as a kind of small Japanese Mustang, certainly a car to be cherished. Mm. Mark, I'm thinking that in 1967, mm. a Corolla, a well-prepared Corolla, would have been just about the cheapest way into a competitive drive at Mount Panorama. Oh, it sure was. And when you think about bang for your buck, the Toyota Corolla at Mount Panorama certainly delivered. The first generation of Toyota's popular small car may seem to be an unlikely candidate for multiple Bathurst wins, but that's exactly what it achieved in the late 1960s. The little 1.1 litre KE10 Corolla, with its meagre 60 brake horsepower and 85 mile per hour top speed, appeared to be little more than a mobile chicane on a track tailor made for V8 power. However, Bathurst 500 wins in the smaller car classes in those days were highly valued and fiercely contested, as they had a proven influence on showroom sales. And in that context, the new Corolla's nemesis was the Datsun 1000, which is why Toyota and Datsun threw everything they had at winning Class A for the smallest cars in the race, with well-drilled pit crews, exacting car preparation and top driving talent. John, a win at Bathurst in those days brought instant credibility to any new car, didn't it? It was very, very influential. It was. That, mm. that race was really a household thing. And it was terrific to see just ordinary cars, mm. you know, just racing against each other. As a, as a kid I, and adolescent and adult, 
I loved it. Well, it really meant something, didn't it? I mean, they were, they were basically stock standard cars. And you look back at some of these old photos of these cars, like these little Corollas oh. going through the dipper. At just, perilous angles. Oh, two wheels Absolute, off the deck, yeah, the suspension yeah, all cranked. Yeah. They were doing that for 500 miles or 800 kilometres in stock standard trim, not only finishing the race, but winning. I mean, that was massive it, credibility it for the proved Japanese. It proved something. It well, absolutely did. Yeah, for yes. the Japanese car yes, industry. Indeed. Overall. Yes. Yeah. The KE10 Corolla made its Bathurst 500 debut in 1967 with a three-car team backed by local Toyota assemblers AMI. In a gruelling fight with Datsun lasting almost seven hours, the new Corolla emerged the victor, only to be stripped of its win after post-race technical checks revealed engine and suspension tweaks which were outside the regulations. The 1968 race saw another intense Class A battle. But this time, it was the Datsuns which suffered the embarrassment of a post-race scratching due to illegal engine tweaking. The Works Corollas finished a resounding 1-2 and one lap clear of the nearest Datsun. The big-hearted Corolla proved its 1968 win was no fluke when it raced to an emphatic two-lap thrashing of its Datsun foe in the 1969 race. Two Bathurst class wins from three starts for Toyota and two from two for young gun Bob Morris who would later become both an outright Bathurst 1000 winner and Australian touring car champion. With a larger 1.2 litre engine, the KE10 Corolla returned to the mountain for a fourth and final time in 1970, where it was outgunned by new Datsun 1200 and Mazda 1300 opponents. Not that it really mattered, because Australia's love affair with Toyota's tough and reliable small car was already well established. Don't forget, you can join the conversation on the Shannon's Club forums with a host of interesting topics. My name is Peter Robinson. This is a 1967 Corolla. They were first produced in 66. This is a little manual car. It was bought by a little old lady out of a Colac dealership, and it's the earliest example that I've ever seen. It's 1100ccs, four speed, drum brakes. The car is basically as you see it, there were a few bits missing when I bought it. Parts are getting very, very hard to find. It lacked a bit in the steering and brake department and we're gradually turning it back into what it used to be. The interior is fairly original. Bottom of the front seats have been reupholstered, but it's a very, very original car. And they're just fun to drive. We started fixing cars in 57 and the Toyota influence has been incredible. Their engineering and design is remarkable. And I've been playing with Corollas since 1971. There's a girl whose car I looked after and she actually was so thankful at what I'd done, she actually made me a cap with a Corolla on it, a picture of her car with an aerial and all, and started calling me Captain Corolla. And that title stuck. Probably five or seven years since that I've had insurance with Shannon's. I've always enjoyed going to their auctions where they seem to be able to pass on some really lovely cars to enthusiasts at the price that those cars are really worth, which is sometimes hard to get. When it's finished, it won't be hard to find a buyer. I do get phone calls from people around the country who know of my reputation and quite happily will come and look at a car like this. Or I have actually sold cars interstate without people inspecting them. And that's a nice feeling. Tony Hansen from Shannon's Auctions joins us with a market update on the KE10 Corolla. Welcome, Tony. Thanks, John. Welcome to the show, mate. Hey, Mark. The KE10, the first Corolla. I mean, this mm. car has been one of the biggest selling cars in the world All time. in automotive history. I mean, that must make the KE10 pretty significant. Well, the first of the model, for sure. Yeah. yeah. yeah very desirable little car. Okay, and do you see many at the auctions or does it tend to be more like of a club scene? Yeah, we've, had, we've had a couple through over the years. Yeah. But yeah, look, I think the club scene's quite quite strong at the moment. Yeah. Is mm. interest increasing in them, do you think? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, Because mm. um, they be, they're becoming rarer, harder to find, and yeah. But I think that's why cars like that, I mean, you might look at it, it's just a Corolla, but you, you know, these cars, they were bought and they were driven into the ground, a lot of them, because they were so reliable and so durable and yeah, they just yeah. get driven and driven and driven until they stopped 
And that's why they're so hard to find today. That's right. There yeah. was also the fantastic little two-door wagon yes. and the fully imported yes. Sprinter oh, Cooper. Sprinter. Yes. Beautiful yeah. looking car. Lovely little car. Do you see many of those? I mean, they're even rarer than the Sedan. Very, yeah, they are rarer, but no, we don't see many of those at all in the auction department. Very, mm. very few and far between. Mm. The Sprinter would have been sort of quite cherished, though, wouldn't it, probably? I mean, you, you think so. A lot of people would have just bought Corollas because they were cheap cars, but mm. the Sprinter would be an enthusiast. You oh, think sure. Would Even back in, back in those days. Back in those sure. days, yeah, yeah. For sure. yeah. yeah. And the Japanese car scene is just one of those things that's growing massively, no matter what brand yeah. it is. So the JDM the, stuff, yeah, for yeah. sure. Very so, popular. So in terms of a KE10, if you found one, the idea is to take it back to original? I would think so. Yep. Yeah. Try to find the original hubcaps that go on it, all that sort of stuff. Original yeah. trim. Original trim. And is there enough value in the car now, if you found one that was in pretty bad shape, to do a full restoration or wouldn't you get wouldn't you get your money back? parts would be hard to find yeah you'd have to go through the club scene to find parts yeah mm -hmm. um but i think uh, not so much a full resto i think just get it back on the road and tidy. enjoy it tidy, yeah, tidy, just tidy, tidy it, it up, up. Yeah, mm -hmm. get it reliable and away you go and i imagine this would be a, a practical classic today you know, given the car's renowned durability and its smoothness it's just a, a very enjoyable car to drive even, even in today's context yeah i mean it still keeps up with the traffic mm -hmm. nice little car to find if you can find one that is yeah. not too many of them around at the moment it really was the, the Japanese small car that changed our ideas of, about small cars, I think. Yeah, yeah it I really agree. was. Yeah, yeah, outstanding. Fantastic. Mm. Well, thank you very much for joining us no, today, Tony. And remember, you can find all the latest auction results on the Shannon's Club website. If you'd like a memorable competition image of the KE10 Corolla, visit the archive at autopix.com.au. It's interesting looking back on this, you know, the first generation Corolla, the thing that really sticks in my mind, and you put it in that late 1960s context, was the incredibly high level of engineering refinement and performance that that car brought for, for, for such a small price. Well, that car went within two miles an hour in mm. third gear of the top speed of a Mini. Well, there in you go. In fourth gear, that just tells you that, uh, what, a, what, a, what a remarkable advance it, it, it offered. It really was, and, and, and up until that point, yeah, the, the 1960s was a really changing situation for the Japanese because they came out of the post-war rubble. Yep, yep. They were back there becoming big exporters and the quality of their product in the 1960s just changed everyone's perceptions of Japanese. Well, with the Corolla, they wanted to put an overhead camshaft engine in mm. it, but they just didn't have the technology available to them at the time in Japan to do it. Yeah, it was a really exciting time it's, in the auto industry. It certainly was, yeah. yeah. We hope you've enjoyed reflecting on the Japanese small car that changed the game and we'll catch you next time on Shannon's Club TV.